Uh, my name is Ian Clark. I'm the founder of Freenet. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're uh, very grateful to be supported by uh, FUDO. We're a FUDO grant recipient. And our mission is to fix the internet's fatal flaw. Uh, can I go back? OK. <laughs> Right click? Uh, uh, not sure about that. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so we'll start uh, with a little bit of history, um, if I get out of the way of the protector. Um, so, 1969, a group of researchers were working on how to build a communication network that could survive a nuclear attack. Um, and the way they designed it was using packet switching, which meant that if any... Okay, here we go, okay. Um, and so that was built to use packet switching, which meant that if any part of the network was damaged or destroyed, it could automatically root around it. And this work was funded by the US uh, Department of Defense. Uh, jump forward 25 years uh, to the mid-90s, and this is really when the internet began to uh, enter the mainstream. People were going to university and discovering it there. People were signing up with AOL online a little bit later, uh, dial-up and broadband. And the killer apps of the internet really ended up being two protocols, um, the first being the World Wide Web, which we all know, and email, which of course we all also know. And both of those protocols are client-server um, client server architectures. Uh, there was also, those of you old enough may remember Usenet, uh, which was all kind of Reddit before Reddit, uh, which is still around but uh, hasn't been very widely used for a number of decades. Uh, but generally speaking, the killer apps of the internet all ended up being client-server architectures where you've got a large number of clients, just typically people's own computers at home, and they were primarily just responsible for being a user interface for the user, and they would talk to servers that were sitting in centralized uh, data centers controlled by large organizations. Um, so this was around the time uh, I was, at that time, studying computer science and artificial intelligence at the University of Edinburgh, and I was learning about how the internet worked, and around this time, people would say things like, oh, the internet roots around censorship, kind of an allusion to the original ARPANET design where it did, uh, was in fact designed to root around damage. But as I was learning more and more about how the internet actually worked, I realized that rather than being this anarchic uh, haven for free, kind of individual empowering communication, it was actually potentially the most easily controlled and censored communication medium humanity has yet created. So I started to think about how, you, how you'd solve this. I wrote a paper as an undergrad. Uh, I got a B for the paper. Uh, but it described a layer on top of the internet that would allow people to publish and consume information without fear of censorship that would be, com that would be completely decentralized, so not rely on any central servers. And this became Freenet, and it snowballed into an open source project. Um, as Lewis mentioned, my undergrad paper describing it uh, ended up being, being one, one of the most cited computer science papers of the following year, uh, despite the typos and spelling mistakes. Um, and Freenet really pioneered um, a lot of ideas that have since found their way into all sorts of things. So, uh, cryptographic contracts, for example, it was really the first example of deployed cryptographic contracts. They later formed the basis of blockchain and, and that whole world. Uh, small world networks, which may also call distributed hash tables. We built the first uh, example of a distributed hash table um, and deployed it across the world a long time before anyone else did. But on the negative side, Freenet was always really kind of hobbyist grade software. It was very experimental. Um, we were all kind of computer science types, um, not 
user interface type people. And so it was, it was hard to use, and, and most of the people using it were kind of privacy enthusiasts. Um, it also, Freenet kind of worked like Dropbox in that you could put information in it and you or other people could later retrieve that information, but it couldn't do any com computation beyond that. And it also couldn't do real-time communication. So jump forward another 25 years to today. And this is something we've, we've touched on a lot today, so I, I, I won't, uh, I'll try not to repeat that. But in short, the entire internet, both the services we use and the infrastructure it's been built on, are controlled by a small number of pretty unaccountable, gigantic corporations. And this is created, and, and this really happened as a result of the client-server architecture, because the client-server architecture inherently concentrates power, and, and we're, we see the result of that with these companies who can, they can, uh, they can censor you, they can unperson you, they can cut you off from all of the tools and services that are just a, a essential part of everyday life, and there's really no re recourse. So we're in a, a very dangerous situation right now, uh, in my opinion. So w what does the solution look like? Um, so Lacutus, which is, which is the new software that we're building, is a drop-in replacement for the World Wide Web. When I say drop-in, what, what does that mean? That means that uh, Lacutus can work with the tools that people, that you're already familiar with. So the web browser, HTML, CSS, web sockets, all of this user interface technology that everyone is already very, very familiar with, uh, Lacutus works with that seamlessly. Um, Lacutus, uh, and so the idea is that you're, you're working with the tools you already know and we really don't have to change behaviors in a significant way in order to get adoption, which is essential with something like this because it's one thing to create something that's kind of a curiosity, maybe it advances the state of the art in a couple of ways, but that's not going to solve the problem. What, what's gonna solve the problem is something that's capable of achieving broad adoption for a very, to, to solve a very wide variety of problems, and that is our goal. And hopefully by the end of this short presentation, I'll, I'll convince you that uh, we have a, a fruitful approach to, to solving that problem. So what, what exactly is this? So it's, this is software, we're writing it in Rust. Uh, the reason we're using Rust is that it allows us to be pretty low level, keep it very efficient. Uh, Rust also has a lot of security benefits. Um, and it's small, so the actual software, the, the client software um, that provides a gateway to this kind of decentralized internet is just a couple of megabytes. And this is, this is important because it's got to be incredibly painless for people to get up and running on it. When we think about how we're building this, we think, uh, what's this gonna need to be able to do for our parents' generation to be able to use it, people who are perhaps not very technical? Um, and this is, this is a very different mindset than what we were thinking about 23 years ago. We're trying to build consumer-grade software here. Um, one way to think about it is as a global decentralized operating system. So this is a platform where uh, a platform where software can run, but instead of running on a single computer, it's running distributed across a global network of computers in a way that's secure and in a way that's able to work reliably, even though the, the computers that form this global network, it's not trusted hardware. These are not computers sitting in a data center that you control. These are just ordinary people running the software, and so it has to be designed in such a way that malicious people can't set up nodes in the network and cause trouble. Um, in terms of what can it do, uh, our ambition is, is pretty limitless. Um, we're, we're building this so that you can build messaging apps, you can build group chat apps, 
uh, social media, search, discovery, uh, collaboration tools like GitHub or Google Docs, um, and even distributed computation. Um, now, our goal is to build something that can really just works the same as what people are already using, but the same isn't really good enough. Um, it, it's got to be better if people are going to adopt it. Um, and so how do you do that, though? Because it's the, the reason why everything was built using this client-server architecture to begin with is because it's much easier that way. So we're trying to build it in a decentralized way, which is a much more difficult problem. And on top of that, we've got to, uh, it's got to do better than what, pe than what people are using today, aside from the more philosophical benefit of it being decentralized. Fortunately, there, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, there are, there are a lot of problems with the internet today that are really kind of baked into the, ori the internet's original design. And uh, people have tried to address them with various techniques, but none of them work very well because the bug is really in the operating system. Uh, so examples of this type of problem are spam and denial of service attacks. Um, and you see the solutions that people try to use, like captures, just don't work. It's actually, uh, it costs more to put Google's CAPTCHA on your website than it does for an attacker to defeat the CAPTCHA. Um, so uh, these solutions are both cumbersome and they actually don't do what they're supposed to do. Similarly, uh, every website you go to on the internet, they've got different logins, they've, some of them have two-factor authentication, some of them don't. Some of them use SMS for two-factor authentication, which is a bad idea. Um, and this forces, this again has forced people to try to find solutions like password managers and anyone who's been paying attention to the LastPass drama over, over the last six months ago um, uh, can see the problem with that. So again, we have something that's kind of inherent in how the internet was designed, kind of different logins for every website you go to and different approaches for how to handle user authentication. And the, the solutions that exist today really aren't very good. And then similarly, the protection of private data, private keys, passwords, and all of this, as evidenced by LastPass again, uh, there just aren't good solutions to this today, and it has very real-world consequences in terms of people's security and safety. If you get hacked today, that is incredibly damaging, incredibly damaging. So the fact that we are building something from the ground up allows us to think, well, wait a minute, if we were creating the internet today, maybe there's a way we can do it that would solve these problems. Um, <clears throat> so what is, what is this fundamentally, like to kind of get tangible, what have we actually built? So the foundation of Locutus is a key value store. It's distributed, it's global, um, all, it's one store for the entire planet, it's decentralized of course, and it's scalable. It's a, it's a small world network, which means that it can scale up to potentially billions of peers if necessary. Um, this key value store is observable, which means that not only can you put information in it and get information out, you can also modify information and you can subscribe to modifications and be notified immediately when those uh, notifications uh, be notified immediately when those uh, changes occur. So this facilitates real-time communication using this as the substrate. Um, uh, as I mentioned, values in this store, they're just bytes. So because we kind of think of this as building an operating system, we try to keep everything as flexible and low level as possible. So we use just raw array of bytes. We can take advantage of things like memory mapping and so on, all of these operating system tools to keep it super efficient and super flexible. Uh, we are, this also facilitates efficient replication of changes and also auto-scaling. 
So if you put some data into the system and it becomes wildly popular very quickly, if this was the internet, you'd probably be dealing with, a, with an overloaded server. Um, but this will actually scale up automatically in response to demand. This is probably the, technically the, the thing that really sets this apart from everything else. Keys in this key value store are WebAssembly code. Um, a key, in fact, is, is a hash of some WebAssembly code and some additional parameters. And the role of that WebAssembly code, it does several things. So firstly, it provides a function that says um, this value, this, this kind of block of bytes, is permitted under this key. Now, in a simple case, that might do something like verify that the value is accompanied by a digital signature with a specific public key. That would allow you to publish information for one person to, or anyone with the private key to publish information under that key and other people could access it and be assured that it was published by the, by, by the person you think it was published by. Um, secondly, the contract provides a way where if you have two valid values, it provides a way that you can merge them. And so one of the big problems with any decentralized system is what about data consistency? What about if, if a peer gets disconnected from the network, it comes back onto the network, and maybe it's got old versions of data? How, does it, uh, how, do, how do we avoid making that a problem? And so the way, the way this works is that in that situation, when a peer comes back up, it will virtually immediately discover that it's got an old version of the data, and this will be uh, uh, updated and synchronized very efficiently to bring it up to speed. So this gives us eventual consistency. Um, <clears throat> and then because this is WebAssembly code, this is really giving you very fine-grained control over what these key values can do. They can serve a function um, similar to a database or similar to a file system or uh, various other systems, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this can serve a function similar to a database. You could build a database on top of this. Um, similarly, it can serve a function similar to a, a file system or a real-time publish subscribe system, like Apache, kind of similar to Apache Kafka. Uh, you could also think of it as a global, literally global shared memory. Um, and Again, write access to this is mediated by code and cryptography, so everything can be independently verified. If a peer in the network tries to modify data in a way that's not permitted, that'll be immediately apparent to other peers in the network. So the fact that we're running on untrusted hardware, we use cryptography to solve that. Um, we can also build quite sophisticated systems on top of this. So for example, we can build data flow systems, uh, or you might call it materialized view in a database, where this can be used to do things like index data for a web search engine, or do all kinds of uh, uh, distributor, solving distributed processing problems, potentially even training a large language model, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, load balancing is automatic, scalability is automatic, uh, just scales up and down how replicated data is depending on the demand. Uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, you have about three minutes. Okay, and then questions after that? Okay. So, so in terms of logins and spam and all of these problems, how do we address that? We've got a concept we, we call Sidekick. Um, this is essentially an avatar that represents your interests. It, it's software that runs on your computer. It does several things. So firstly, it stores private data. So you can see a little bit like uh, cookies or local storage in a web browser, um, except it's much, much, much more powerful. Because not only do you store the data, but you also store code that limits access to the data. So for example, you could store a private key um, in, in your sidekick, and 
uh, if you want to sign something, you ask the sidekick to do it for you. The sidekick is able to kind of ask you questions or ask you permission to do it. Um, it really kind of takes, takes this idea to the next level. And it's also extensible. So uh, your sidekick consists of software components we call delegates. Again, they're WebAssembly. It's very easy to add delegates to your sidekick. Um, the, and these delegates can also talk to each other. So this is uh, almost aside from the kind of global shared uh, memory peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it, this is a way that uh, you can create like a personal assistant that, keep, that mines your private data and acts on your behalf on this network. Okay. So in terms of where are we in development, uh, so we have a transparent development process. Our uh, project management software is wired up to our website. You can go to freenut.org and see our uh, milestones there, and they update in real time. Um, implemented in Rust, as I mentioned. Um, because the contracts and the delegates are implemented in WebAssembly, you can write those in Rust, Zig, C, AssemblyScript, or any other language that compiles to WebAssembly. Um, we released version 0.1 of our software development kit back in November. Um, and so people could start playing with the APIs, and we could start getting feedback on the APIs and how that works. Uh, last month, we released what we call our anti-flood token system, which, which is a proof of concept system to prevent spam. Um, and uh, right now, actually, we're, we're locally testing a proof of concept decentralized messaging system, uh, uh, which is both a web interface and also the kind of back end contracts that make all of that work. And uh, in about two months, we expect to have that up and running on the uh, decentralized network itself. Uh, so that was very quick, but uh, uh, happy to take any questions. N no, not, not exactly. I mean, you, you could deploy it as a browser plugin, it, but it's, it's an actual binary, so it's kind of compiled Rust code. It's about three to four megabytes in size, so it's very quick and it can install kind of like a driver. Well, it's blended in the sense that you use it through a web browser. So, so the web interface is, uh, the interface to it is a web browser, but the web browser, instead of talking to a server, it's talking to the software that's running on your local machine, just using HTTP and web sockets. Oh, so it looks like a server to the browser? Correct. It to be local. Yeah, so, so no, no browser extension is required, although um, there might be things you could do with an extension that you couldn't do otherwise, but it doesn't intrinsically require that. Uh, how does the Locutus architecture compare to IPFS? Um, it's quite different. Um, so I think IPFS kind of started as, I would kind of describe it as a decentralized Dropbox. They layered things on top of it. But Locutus is, Locutus is kind of a simple architectural idea that's designed to be extremely flexible uh, to do a very wide variety of things. So I think. IPFS is kind of more narrowly focused, but then they started to layer things on top of it, like PubSub, um, to, ex to extend its capabilities. But with Locutus, you get that kind of stuff for free, and it's just baked into the primitives of the architecture. Um, I guess that, that's the quickest way to describe it. But uh, IPFS has nothing like um, the, the contract mechanism, so providing fine-grained write access, but IPFS does actually support us. Uh, so we're building on uh, libp2p, which is the peer-to-peer -peer library that they've developed. So we're, we're, we're friends with them, um, uh, but it's quite different. Yeah, so... Um, it's probably a longer answer than, than I can do right now, but but 
for a for a kind of messaging app, the the contract would serve as an inbox, and uh, this would be kind of one to one messaging. So you would use your contract as an inbox. Other people could add messages to your inbox, which you your phone, let's say it's offline, it would come online. It would access your your inbox contract on the network, and um, uh, it would then be able to download your messages. So it doesn't require that your peer is always on. Um, yeah, so the question was, how, how do we deal with the spam abuse problem? Um, and the answer is, there's, there are simple answers and there are more complex answers. So uh, as a proof of concept, we developed what I mentioned, which is called our anti-flood tokens. This is, this is a mechanism where uh, you create a token generator that will generate new tokens at a fixed interval, maybe once every 30 minutes or something like that, depending on usage. And then let's say if I want to send you a message, I have to spend one of these anti-flood tokens in order to get the message into your inbox. And your inbox can specify what flavor of token you need. So if, you're, uh, if you want it to be difficult for people to send you a message, you could say, I want to have an hour anti-flood token, which means you, you need one of the tokens that's only generated once an hour. And so you can, you can adjust that. Um, so that's a very kind of simple example of how you can do it. There, there are more sophisticated examples which use blind signatures in order to bless public-private keys, which you can then use to uh, give to people temporarily, uh, uh, where if you then try to spam them, or if it turns out that your message is spam, or you engage. This really works with almost any transaction. So it's kind of a, it's a trust token where uh, I give you my token, we have an interaction. If the interaction goes well, you, you give it back, or it kind of goes back to me by default. But if, if I abuse that relationship, you can destroy that token, which will cost me. Um, so there, there's no one answer to the question. We're, kind of, we're providing an infrastructure on which this kind of system can be built, but we're building reference implementations to demonstrate what's possible. Yeah, so if you go to freenetproject.org, um, so that'll be Fred. That'll be, the, that'll be the original version of Freenet that's been around for a while. If you go to freenet.org, it's a little bit, we're, we're in the process of kind of rearranging the branding at the moment, so it's, so it's a little bit confusing. But if you go to freenet.org, that is mostly about Locutus, and you can find our GitHub page there and our matrix room where we talk about it and all sorts of other things. Um, right now, it's hard because it's, it's in development, but, but it will be extremely easy. It'll be as easy as you can install any software. So it'll be, you know, on Windows, it'll be a couple of clicks to get it installed. Similarly, on Mac, on Linux, it'll probably just be cargo install or uh, apt install. So as easy as it can be. And we also have ideas for ways that uh, people can use it in a hosted way, which of course defeats the point of decentralization, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a way that people can experiment with it without even having to install the software. But installing the software will be incredibly easy. Um, okay, I think i uh, better wrap it up. Thank you very much.